Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, December 30th, and this is the weekly market update. Okay, a few items. Uh, first of all, last show of the year for 2023. Again, the channel continues to grow. Appreciate that. Shifted the newsletter over to Substack. Uh, it seems to be working fairly well, starting to get signups now. Again, for you folks that are on the grandfathered uh, rates, you'll stay on the old system, at least for right now, until I figure something else out. But uh, new subscribers, please, uh, if you are wanting to subscribe, uh, if you want to try the newsletter, then please uh, go go to uh, that via the Substack. And there's a link in the show notes below. Uh, and so... You know, I want I want to just uh, kind of plug that. You know, the free e email. I send out a free email once a week that has. Uh, sometimes I write an article, short article about a theme that we've been talking about in these videos, or something around some articles, podcasts that I've listened to, what have you. And so I send those out once a week. I don't spam. And so you may find those useful, and you can subscribe to that via Substack also. Uh, either the free uh, email I send out every week or the, you know, paid subscription to the Actionable Intelligence Alert newsletter. So I uh, want to plug those. want you to please take a look at that uh, at Substack and see if you are uh, find it useful. The good thing about the emails that I send out, they kind of are archived there as articles. So even if you miss one or don't choose to sign up to have them sent to you, you can always go to the site and check out the writings because they get archived, kind of like a blog. So there's that. So that's went very well. Uh, like I said, pretty much all of our metrics were up this year. And I suspect uh, from what I've talked to other folks or seen other folks' results that moving to Substack really accelerates the growth of the uh, channels. But we'll see. Again, this is all reader sub sub supported, uh, listener supported. So I uh, appreciate uh, you know you helping me grow the channel. Again, this is the last show of the year, and uh, grateful for the growth in the YouTube channel and the folks coming here every week and listening to the musings. Uh, we'll go over here the final data for the actionable intelligence alert newsletter for. 2023 here in a second. Uh, the disclaimer, anything that you hear or see on this podcast is not to be taken as investment advice. I'm not a financial planner. I cannot give you personal financial advice. Please do your own due diligence. It's your money. It's your responsibility. Okay, so the Actionable Intelligence Alert Newsletter Q4 and Calendar Year 2023 Performance. As you can see, I have both columns here of the uh, newsletter and the S&P, and then the quarterly breakdowns. Now, these are not going to be dead nuts, correct, because uh, the software I use doesn't account for the cash that's in the account and the interest you would have got on that, or dividends, or assuming dividends reinvested, or what have you. It's just a basic calculation. Um, what it does do is uh, if a dividend is paid on a stock, it just lowers the cost basis of the stock. So uh, understand that. Another thing to understand is that uh, past performance is not a guarantee of future performance. So as you can see in uh, Q4, it was kind of interesting. We were like almost exactly the same return in the portfolio as the S&P, we basically beat the S&P by 0.01%. So uh, one thing I will point out is the, um, I think overall for the year, I didn't, or I, I didn't show just the, for the year, but I think we were up like 26% or 27%, something like that. I don't remember, 24%. Uh, but we did beat the S&P, obviously, you can see uh, on the quarterlies, uh, we basically uh, beat them. It's interesting, you know, just this quarterly return of 11.24%, that would exceed just the average yearly return for stocks over the long term. So um, we are beating 
all, we are meeting our, and exceeding our goal, which is to basically give people the opportunity from an active portfolio management perspective to beat what they would get just passively investing in an ETF or, you know, a no load mutual fund. So uh, that's kind of how I look at it. Now, what's interesting is if you look at the overall return, now this just started calculating all of this going back to January of 2020. And obviously we benefited from, you know, their mean reversion in energy stocks. This is why we're crushing the S and P. Uh, but uh, for the year, we, we, we still beat the S and P by a couple percentage points this year. And I think that, uh, going into next year, uh, just based on what I'm seeing or what my base case is, you know, again, I don't think that the business cycle has been abrogated. Uh, and, you know, I listen to a lot of podcasts, a lot of opinions, and people are saying, well, you know, there was, I think one thing I will acknowledge that I didn't incorporate fully into my views were the fact just underestimating the amount of of the fiscal stimulus that was pumped into the economy and is still being pumped into the economy. You know, it may be where a lot of the free money to people and the um, abatements about having to, you know, pay your rent and all that stuff, that's all kind of went away for the consumer, but there's still a lot of pent up supply of money coming down the pipeline for this inflation recovery act and reindustrialization, central planning. So we do need to keep that into consideration. That That is what I think has really kept things, the amount of trillions of dollars that have been pumped into the economy over the last couple of years, you know, has been holding back a full-blown recession in my, in my view. And we really, I didn't really take that into enough of consideration. Nevertheless, uh, I still don't think that the business cycle has been abrogated and uh, I think that there is data, that, that's why the, the economy is kind of mixed pudding, if you will, mixed fruit salad. You've got certain things that are negative, like manufacturing overall. Uh, other, other sectors of the economy are struggling, but you have other sectors that are doing well. And again, you still have employment, for the most part, holding up. Although if you look at certain subsectors, or if you look at uh, certain things, it, it appears it's slowly but surely weakening, but we will see. Uh, so you may have this rolling recession type situation. You may have, you know, uh, difficult to say. I still am of the view that, um, you know, liquidity and sediment is what drives markets. You know, there's many stocks, uh, tech stocks that, that, that were up, you know, over 200% this year. Is that something that you think will continue or would you rather look at what's undervalued and be buying that sell the overvaluation and buy undervaluation. Well, some people you just won't be able to convince. And I, you know, they, they, there's a lot of people on wall street. Most people, they chase performance. They don't really have a view. They don't really have a methodology. They just, you know, something's going up. So they get on the bandwagon. So that that's just human nature. And so uh, I guess that can work in the short term. Uh, it has worked for people. You see them all over Twitter. It was funny. I was watching that movie last night. Uh, I forget what it, was, what it was about, but it was about the whole GameStop, you know, uh, phenomenon and how that went down. But, uh, you know, ultimately, fundamentals do come through. And so, yeah, you can have some kind of one-off or short time of performance. You know, one of the things that you really have to keep in mind if you're going to look at somebody that it, that you're taking advice from or what have you or listening to, what is their long-term track record? And I mean long-term being five, 10 years or more. You know, so anybody can put up one quarter, one, you know, half of a year or a full year of performance, but then what happens after that? What does somebody do through a full market cycle uh, and, and what's their performance? So I think what I have found, at least that works for me, I'm not a trader uh, and, and I don't besmirch people that, you know, if they are having success, then, you know, God bless them, Allah be with them. 
and uh, I wish him continued success, but that's just not what I do. Uh, I look for undervaluation. I look for trend reversals. I look for stuff going from terrible to less terrible, and that served me well, and uh, I will continue to do that. So this is the performance. Uh, I think it uh, speaks for itself. I think that, uh, you know, I've had three years now of decent performance. I'm not, you know, before that, our performance wasn't that good. I just haven't incorporated in that. That's kind of selective. But uh, I think that, um, you know, I've learned a lot since I started doing this six years ago. So um, I've really refined my technique. So I'm grateful for the support and uh, hopefully we'll have the continued success in the new year. So what am I thinking about for 2024 themes? Well, uh, uranium, for example, uh, I think the easy money has been made, but I think it's going higher. How much higher? I don't know. There's a, that's kind of the discussion, right? You know, you talk about two years ago, three years ago, people would chastise you for even bringing up uranium as a potential investment theme. Now, the main argument on FinTwit is how high is uranium going to go? And, you know, those kind of some kind of esoteric discussions around the composition and tax treatment of the various ETFs. You know, I saw another uh, uh, email yesterday about the Sprott Trust not having the redemption uh, clause or and, and why that turns it into a horrible uh, investment. So I don't get that deep into these things. Uh, I stick to the fundamentals. And I think that if you do that, these things will out. Uh, you'll you'll do well. And the fundamentals haven't changed. That's why I really don't talk about uranium that much. Uh, I'm grateful to see it making new highs. I can understand why some of the stocks are lagging. But, uh, you know, I think that at some point, you know, my ultimately what I think is going to happen, I don't know if it happens this year, probably there's a good chance that we could have a blow off this year. Eventually we're going to have it in this year. 2024 could be, you know, the year. But something's going to happen that's really going to shake everybody's view and turn everybody ultra bullish, like a musical chairs event or something like that. And everybody's going to, it's going to hit them in the head that there simply isn't enough supply. It's going to become the mainstream view. And I think that will cause a, you know, a lot of money to come into the sector. So, uh, how high that takes the price of uranium or uranium stocks, I, I, it's not possible to know. But uh, I do think that we continue to move higher over time until we start seeing investment flows into the sector, people talking about you know investing and building new mines. We, we just aren't seeing that type of discussion. What we're seeing is a lot of discussion about, like I said, speculating on how high it can go and what the best vehicle is to take advantage of that. That tells you that you're not at the beginning of this upcycle. Uh, the second thing here, offshore oil services goes without saying. There's been in, I've, I've talked about it enough. It's the same thing. These first two themes, basically, first three, three themes actually, you know, they're just some stuff that we got on very early on and has be, has in the process of mean reverting. Um, and so. Again, the super easy money has been made, but I still think that there's plenty of meat on the bone on all three of these themes. Uh, so I'll continue to hold uh, really bullish on all offshore oil services. Obviously, with the price of oil coming in recently, uh, people, you know, lose interest in these things. But we look at them from long term perspective. You know, we've got a certain. Uh, uh, service vessel company that's probably going to be cash flowing $25 a year or more per share, $25 per share a, a year or more in the next couple of years. And so, you know, that's where the stock, you know, could trade substantially higher from where it's at. And I think a lot of these companies, I think people are going to be very shocked when they see how high some of these companies end up tra trading because of the fact that they're now converting the higher day rates, although, and you'll see, see more of this in 2024, the higher day rates for the rigs and the boats uh, will now be translated to cash flow. And they really don't have anything to do with the cash flow except pay down debt and then buy back shares, right? So that's going to be very accretive to equity holders. And I think you're really going to see how that can affect some stock prices in the next year or so. So I'm sticking with that theme. Energy, 
world short of molecules. Uh, that goes without saying. I think you just got to pick your spots, right? Pick your timing. Uh, I'm not, I'm still bullish on coal. I'm, I'm looking at various uh, things, you know, re-entries. I found uh, another coal stock that's going to begin production. Uh, uh, so I'm looking at it right now, may add it uh, later. It's just another situation where, you know, things are mispriced because the the consensus view is incorrect. And so the mispricing takes place. Once reality hits, like it did in uranium, you know, like it's done in oil, uh, these things have a tendency to re-rate, right? So that's working so far. Another thing that I'm very bullish on, uh, this is more of a longer term theme. I think we're catching a bid, uh, you know, in emerging markets, uh, select emerging markets. Uh, I've already added a couple of Brazilian stocks to the portfolio. They're already up double digits. Uh, I expect more of that. Uh, if you look at, uh, we're entering a new liquidity cycle around the world. Uh, and these, a lot of these central banks were ahead of the curve in raising rates to quench inflation. And now they're ahead of the developed world central banks in cutting rates. Not to mention the fact that some of these comp countries like Brazil are commodity, very strong commodity producing companies. And I think that the rest of this decade is going to be, uh, you know, I don't know if you want to use the word super cycle. Let's put it this way. It's going to be bullish for hard assets in my view. Uh, and so I think that, uh, you know, a lot of these emerging markets have been out of favor. And I've talked about it before. They usually go in cycles, right, where the developed world or especially the U.S. outperforms. And then these things have a tendency to reverse where the U.S. underperforms and then emerging markets outperform. And these things usually happen for long periods of time, five to 10 year time frame. So I think I think it's it's a good possibility that we're entering one of those times now where emerging markets will outperform uh, developed markets and especially the US. It's just a matter of kind of overvaluation and undervaluation and machine reversion, uh, a lot of it. And again, there's some tailwinds, I think, uh, for a lot of the emerging markets, especially the ones that are particularly uh, commodity producers. Obviously, I am very bullish on gold mining stocks and gold. Um, I think central bank buying has been a big driver of this gold market. I think that's going to continue. Uh, you know, once the U.S. decided to weaponize the dollar and uh, do things, uh, do financial uh, battle, I guess, you know, based on, you know, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, it's kind of set the precedent that has the rest of the world, China and these other countries. There's a slide coming up showing this. A lot of uh, emerging markets now have decided, well, you know, I'm going to uh, be less, uh, I'm going to be reluctant to put my money there because if they'll confiscate Russia's money, they'll confiscate mine. You know, gold held in your possession has no counterparty risk, right? You, you can't, as the United States, fly to China and pull the gold out of their vaults because you got mad at China. So they understand that. Does that mean... You know, I think that's just going to be a constant pr upward pressure is this gold buying that's going to be taking place by these central banks. We've had two years of it now. The last two years have shown uh, basically around a thousand tons or more being bought by central banks. And I think that continues to place upward pressure on the gold price. We really haven't seen the investment demand come in yet. When that happens, I think that's really when the gold price gets going. The gold mining stocks are really undervalued relative to the current price of gold. So it's telling you one of two things. It's either just a bombed out sector that hasn't caught a bid yet, which is my view, and it will uh, once these cash flows come through and it gets more interest. Or the other possibility is, is the gold mining stocks are telling you that the gold price is too high and it needs to come in to you know 14 or 1500. That's a possibility too. Uh, my view is the former, not the latter. Then I have miscellaneous things I'm looking at. Uh, for example, uh, some of these couple junior mining companies bringing mines online. One's a graphite mine in Africa, it's getting ready to come online. Certain things like this. Bitcoin miners have done very well for me in 2023. I think that continues as the Bitcoin price. Cryptocurrencies come back into play as liquidity. You know, these cryptocurrencies are really basically get supercharged by liquidity. They're basically liquidity vehicles that respond to 
higher liquidity. And I think uh, the Bitcoin price with the hal halving coming up, I guess that's how you would say it, right? And uh, that in the past, you know, they upward bias on the Bitcoin price. And then just with all the liquidity, it being a creature of liquidity, I think it moves higher. And that's really, really going to benefit a lot of these, some of the, at least some of the Bitcoin miners that I have uh, been, been following and have small positions in. I'm also interested in still watching like cannabis, but uh, I found a bank that services them that's fairly cheap. I'm looking at that. That's a possibility. There's also a snack foods company that was basically in the dumps. I'm looking at that uh, as a possibility to add to the portfolio just because what was interesting was you had the founders running it. It kind of did well, did one of those SPACs, became public. And then the founder and the previous management was all over the place. They really didn't know how to manage. They weren't focusing on the core brands. They were talking about bringing an energy drink. This is a company that does snack foods. Uh, their, their snack food product is very well taken. So basically the board kicked all the founders out and they brought in consumer packaged good, uh, goods uh, professionals that have had success at other companies. And this management now has you know, been lowering costs and raising sales. What I find interesting is this new CEO who came from uh, a, a very a, a very well-known and successful com consumer packaged goods firm. Uh, he's been buying the stock hand over fist. That really attracts me, right? I really like stock buybacks. I went, so, you know, the guy probably owns about 10% of the company. Now he just buys it out of his own cash. So small little things like that that I'm looking at as possibilities. Obviously, if we get a recession, uh, that will create opportunities also. But uh, th those are the things I'm really kind of looking at in 2024. Um, I'm really excited in particular, like I said, about, uh, you know, the really fat pitch, I think, for next year is going to be gold mining. When I say fat pitch, the thing that could really go up multiples uh, are the gold mining stocks. If gold uh, does what uh, many are thinking it could do, you know, there's no reason why it'd be within the realm of possibility to see gold you know, obviously it seems to have broken out in the stealth bull market. Nobody's really paying attention or they are reluctant to believe that it's broken, out, broken of this $2,000 level. So uh, I think it has. And I just think that the setup that's going to be positive for gold, you know, you have to remember something. I, I'm what I, if you look back in history on gold, you know, basically negative real rates or at least rates trending negative uh, have usually been you know, rocket fuel for the gold price. And when you look at the gold price, you know, we've had positive rates, real rates in this country for a couple of years in the US, and yet gold was continuing to move higher. And I just think that that is a result of the central bank buying that I've been talking about. It's really put a bid under the gold price. And that's all, you know, kind of uh, driven by, you know, what the US has did. Now, whether you find the US's activities correct or incorrect is immaterial, it's okay, what's the results? What's going to happen? And I think, you know, we're looking at the behavior of a lot of foreign central banks that are saying, you know what, I don't need as many dollars in my portfolio. I, I don't want to get crosswise with the US and just have them confiscate, you know, my wealth. Let's, let's start buying some gold. And so I think that's just been, uh, that's an example of using things in the, what the government does or poor decisions made by bureaucrats to your advantage. So getting to the economy, uh, Game of Trades, another good account to follow on Twitter. Uh, this is permanent job losses have accelerated. As you see, you see what happens right before you get these massive spikes. It kind of, you know, this is starting to look a little bit like this, right? Or a little bit like this, where you get this choppiness and all of a sudden the thing goes vertical. I'm not saying that's going to happen. I'm just showing you that, you know, if you had to, if I gave you a million dollars and you had to bet that this was going to either roll over or move higher, what would you bet on? No, knowing what you, what, what you see here, you know, this is pattern recognition, guys. It doesn't mean it's 100% certain, but, you know, I, I, I use these poker analogies or metaphors, what have you, because they make sense, right? If you go read a book on poker, there's dealing with pro probabilities, right? And what you're saying is, okay, if I have a certain hand, say two aces, I'm talking about hold'em, and you have 
you know, deuce seven off suited, you know, if we play any single hand, well, you can beat me by just being lucky and randomness. But if we play that same hand over a thousand or 10,000 times or have a computer do it, the two aces will over time win them win more hands than it will lose against two seven. So what I'm saying is that nothing's certain about the future. The future is completely unknown to us. So what we have to do is just look at, okay, you know, things have a tendency to repeat. And so that's what we're trying to do here. And like I said, I just don't think that the business cycle has went away. Uh, I think it's been delayed a little bit because of the amount of spending going on, but that can't go on forever either. So we'll see. I found this interesting too. I kind of showed a chart this the other day with the um, percent of uh, of the households that have equity exposure as a percentage of liquid assets. Uh, I've talked about this in the past. I mean, they've got all, I don't say, I just say these quips to be funny, I know, or sarcastic, but you know, the average person the, the 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 retail investor, if you will, uh, you know, they're all in. I mean, so it's like once you get the shoe clerks in, the bleacher bumps, the average Joe, lunchbox Joe, um, then, you know, what has happened in the past is you get these percentages up in above 50%, close to 60 something percent of households in the stock market, then you basically get rug pulled and then you have these periods that could go on for a decade where you have uh, no performance or underperformance. And that's what I'm suggesting is going to happen here. This is not a guarantee will happen, but this is what has happened in the past. Okay. We may be in a new era. AI may be takeover and we're just going to have this un unimaginable amount of productivity growth and it's a new era. And I've got it all wrong, but I, I, I believe guys like, David Rosenberg, that the business cycle has not been abrogated. Bob Farrell, it's, you know, his 10 rules for investing, one of them being uh, it's never different this time. And so I'm just going with the odds. And so it's not gone exactly like I've said, but, you know, uh, that's where that's where the percentages, that's where the history points to. So this is interesting. This is a, again, we're on this theme of is this time it's different. So basically we're talking about uh, this chart showing, he says in nearly seven decades, there has never been a post inversion, it's talking about uh, yield curve inversion. There has never been a post inversion equity market rally because that's what usually happens. The equity markets rally uh, using the 10, tre the treasury 10 and two year spreads uh, that has not been more than fully reversed going into a subsequent downturn or bear market. And so you see the various times this has happened. They've got them all charted. You see 22, 23. It's actually exceeded now the returns, 26%, whatever it was last year. Um, and so what you can see, I think, is that this is either going to move sideways, move higher, or move down. If you take all the rest of 70 years of history, again, it's 100% certain that this has happened. This is what you are, if you are bullish on the markets and thinking this is a new era, you may be correct, but you are really swinging against history. I've heard people say on some podcasts that this is a new era. I've heard that before. I heard that before in 2008. 2007. Um, I, if you go back, you can search the internet and find podcasts that I did when I first started doing podcasts way back in the day. They're out there uh, archived about the housing bubble. And I was calling that out. And because it's not different, okay? You're not going to get away from, you know, physics and economic reality and human nature of greed and envy. These things repeat. And so, that's what I'm betting on, a repeat of things that have happened in the past. Again, this is 100% is every single time that we've had these post-inversion equity market rallies. They always reverse when we go into a bear market. Again, this could be the first one. It's not, you know, nothing is certain. But again, where do, if I gave you a million dollars 
and you had to bet on it, and those were your only two choices, that this is going to continue higher or follow history and end up in a pretty substantial drawdown, what would you bet on? That's the question you have to ask yourself. And if you say this is a new era, then you have to say, well, what's different this time? Because you can go all the way back to the 30s when the radio came out, the new technology then was radio and the automobile was really good. And this was going to change everything. And it did change things. You know, and then we had the uh, electronics, you know, breakthroughs in the 60s. And then we had, you know, uh, technical, you know, the internet. It was going to change everything. It was like the railroads or the, you know, it was just going, and it did change the world. But that doesn't mean that all of the companies that were uh, purporting to benefit from it made money and did well. Same thing in housing, the same thing. It just repeats. And so I'm just saying, uh, again, that you really want to be careful when you're saying that this time is different because people that have been in the markets for 50 years, 60 years, know better. And uh, again, I may be wrong, uh, but again, what else can I go by? If something is 100% in the last 70 years, I got to go with the percentages. So bringing this up, uh, European Central Bank QT, you can see what's happening. I find this interesting. They're going to keep this in. I mean, Europe's in a tremendous recession. It hasn't been acknowledged yet, but it is. I'll show you a chart from, charts from France here in a minute. But you see what's going to happen. This is something similar, you know, uh, coming out of the, uh, you know, these different times when they've had to do these bailouts. I think this was the crisis they had in the banking system back then and you know they run up the balance sheet and then they let it roll off because they know eventually this is going to keep higher highs and higher lows and so uh I, I i did show a chart last week you know we've talked about distressed junk debt and spreads blowing out here in the u.s and it hasn't happened yet but it has happened in europe and so i need to kind of dig deeper into seeing if there's a high yield, you know, uh, debt, uh, junk debt, uh, ETF for Europe or something like that. I just don't know enough about individual companies to, you know, get into that, but they, their spreads, what I'm trying to get at is their spreads have already blown out tremendously. And I think eventually the ECB obviously is going to cut rates and probably take its lead from the fed probably after the Fed cuts, the ECB will start cutting. And again, you know, massive cuts and then another bout of QE once something tremendously breaks somewhere. And so uh, just wanted to show that. So again, this is what happens, right? Here's the France's uh, purchasing manager index for manufacturing and services. You see they're collapsing. Uh, you're down into 2008, get reaching 2008 levels. Uh, this is getting ugly, uh, if you will. This is just one country. The sick man of Europe, okay? Uh, we already have talked about what's happening in Germany, the self-immolation of the German economy. Uh, France now is, uh, you know, basically cratering. Uh, probably need to spend some more time on some of these European countries and what's happening there because it's just going to be a time for the ECB is forced into reversing their policy and then reliquifying again. We have reached peak rates. Rates are coming down around the world. Reliquification is going to happen. Uh, another potential, you know, burst of inflation over the next couple of years. So, this is what we're looking looking at, and, and what's going to drive it is this just you know tighten money. Uh, this is what it causes. You're into that again, trying to drive on that icy road with bald tires, swerving back and forth alternatively slamming the brakes on and then punching the accelerator instead of just taking your foot off the accelerator and gently drift it into the snow bank and take your medicine you're going to oversteer you're going to fix it right you're going to centrally plan it well this is you know it's not going to work so our our goal is not to endorse the view criticize it so much it is what it is how do we make money off it so this is pretty good from U.S. Global Investors uh, and the World Gold Council. Uh, Ten biggest official buyers of gold. You see this is in tons, right? Metric tons. China, obviously, this is uh, for last year or at least through October. So that means there's probably been additional 
purchases, you know, I'm just going to go through a lot of the not friends of the U.S. right now, China, Turkey, Egypt, Iraq, Russia, Libya. You see what they're doing, okay? Um, and a lot of these are commodity producing countries, right? Uh, Libya, oil, Russia, everything, oil, Iraq, Qatar, oil and natural gas. Um, not so much Egypt, but they do have a pretty decent sized natural gas offshore business. And just like, you know, this is what they're doing. And uh, I think in India, it's just a cultural thing. Uh, so you, every country is going to be different. But I think, you know, we're seeing now the second year in a row with probably at least a thousand tons of gold being bought by central banks. And I think that that's probably going to continue. It likely will be price sensitive if the price of gold was to take off. But, you know, anytime I think that gold drops back, you're going to have that buying there. That's why I think gold kind of really held up well, even with real interest rates uh, being um, very positive. And uh, again, here's some game of trades. Uh, 70 percentage of assets allocated to gold by investment advisors. So 71% of the investment advisors out there have told their clients zero to one percent of gold holdings in their portfolio you know when you listen to somebody like ray dalio or other prudent type people you know five to ten percent of your net worth they recommend to put into precious metals so if we're at just like zero probably more to the zero than the one percent you've got you know a tremendous amount of individual investors out there that uh, and this is investment advisors right people are going to listen to their investment advisor and I think that uh, once this moment, once this goes down and people start allocating to gold and precious metals, uh, you could see, again, couple that with central bank buying, and that's how you get a gold bull market. We really need the individual investors to come in. Wanted to point this out because a lot of people weren't paying attention, but Bitcoin is up 150% in 2023. Again, it's a... Like I said, I think this has to do with this halving phenomenon that's coming up. But also, I think it's kind of telling you this is right around the time as I was tracking a lot of the central banks. It may just be a coincidence, but you know, as liquidity has been picking up around the world due to central banks, the majority now, I wouldn't say the majority, but the, the majority of the monthly actions is biased towards cutting, not raising. Like in December, I think there were, I can't remember off the top of my head, but there were like nine or 10 central banks that cut rates and only three that rose rates. The rest were just on pause. So this is what we're tracking. And this has been basically shifting since midsummer, right? August, September, something like that. And that's just basically when this kind of flat lined out here, right? Bottomed. And then we've just, I'm not saying that's the only reason but I, th I do think that Bitcoin is really driven uh, quite a bit by li liquidity flows. And when you have more liquidity coming into markets, uh, I think some of it, some of its, some percentage of it's going to find itself into Bitcoin. And these things are really speculative, right? So they are really shiny objects. They're really, really shiny lures. So when these things are moving, it draws a lot of speculative capital in. And uh, I think this could continue, right? I mean, you've got... I don't follow it that closely, but I do know that, you know, there's multiples of people in the institutions trying to get these Bitcoin ETFs going. So that'll bring even more capital in. Uh, so we'll see what happens. I'll, I like the Bitcoin miners. You know, I focus on a couple of companies that basically are in the business of going to renewable projects that face curtailment issues where the grid is so choked up with capacity that sometimes these renewable assets can't produce because there's nowhere for the power to go. And so they will build a facility uh, right next to or cl pretty close to the renewable uh, energy facility. And when the site cannot sell the power to the grid, they will use the power at a reduced rate uh, they get reduced rates. Uh, so the instead of the unit just sitting there doing nothing, uh, the power, at least some power is getting sold, right, to uh, these renewable miners. Renewable miners get a reduced rate 
that raises that lowers their cost of you know mining these these coins uh so people everybody benefits so i, I those things have started to move a while ago a lot of those were bombed out 90 95 percent um and it, so just another thing to look at uh as an opportunity i think for next year so josh young put this up on twitter i've seen this before but i stole it uh this is why I'm bullish on oil field services, in particular offshore. This is why I say things like we're, we have a shortage of molecules. You know, we have a temporary, you know, oil didn't really perform like a lot of folks thought in 2023. Um, again, it's very difficult to forecast. Uh, but this is what I hang my hat on. You know, the world uses 30, around 31 or 32 billion barrels of oil a year okay uh 31 to 32 something like that billion barrels a year uh and that's going up every year okay the problem is is as i've talked about this before is that oil is an extractive industry you have to replace the barrels that you pump out of the ground or at some point if you're a particular oil company you'll go out of business and because we've had insufficient investment in new re reserves and new production, we have a situation, you know, where uh, because of the lack of investment, we haven't been replacing the barrels that we have been using. And this goes back for a while here. So you look at um, last year, for example, uh, I think this just shows it up to um, 2017 or 18. But anyways, you see that for many, many years with just a few exceptions, we haven't been replacing the 30 billion barrels we've used every year. And so that's why you're seeing reserve. This was happening even before there was a lot of talk about this. And so you couple, you throw on top of that ESG now, which is restricting capital flows into new investment. Like I said, you're not going to build a new billion dollar offshore rig or any of these service vessels. And so the people that do own these things kind of have a slightly bit of a moat around them because now money is beginning to flow into new exploration as people wake up and say, hey, we don't have enough reserves. We need to get, get hot. And so the amount of equipment and knowledge and people is not what it was several years ago. And uh, prices have went up. And so this will be interesting. This is why I'm bullish on it. So We'll see again, you know, there's a, there's a lot of oil in the ground. There's a lot of minerals in the ground. It's just like, how much money do you have to spend to get it out and how long does it take? And that's why I'm so bullish on commodities and real assets for the duration of this decade because of the underinvestment, you know, the, the super cycle, if you want to use that term, the, the next up cycle in commodities, the movement of commodities from undervalued to overvalued, I think will be driven in particular by not demand as it was in the last cycle when China entered the WTO uh, and, you know, just really went nuts with infrastructure spending and just basically sucked in all the econ the commodities like a black hole. I think this particular move is going to be driven uh, mainly by supply, the lack of supply, and just because of the underinvestment. So we will see, but uh, I like these, you know, this is what it is. It simply is the fact that we have not been finding the same amount of oil that we've been using. And at some point that becomes an issue. Again, this is another proof of it from Tavi Costa. This is the uh, capital expenditures as a percent of cash flow. It's near an all time you know, low. It's moving higher now, but historically, um, you know, it's typically up in this range somewhere, right? 60, 50 to 80 percent, 50 to 90 percent of uh, cash flow has been spent on CapEx. And we've been down in this, you know, uh, after the pandemic, uh, basically, um, you know, nobody was, everybody was husbanding cash. And so you've had this three or four years of lack of spending, but stuff was still coming out of the ground. And so now we have to play catch up. And if you want to talk about mean reversion, well, you know, it just doesn't just go up here and stop. You have to go way up here, right? You have to go way higher to catch up and be there for a longer period of time. As we've talked about commodity 
after commodity, after resource sector, after resource sector being in the same boat. So that's it for this uh, for this week. Uh, Happy New Year again. The next time I talk to you will be 2024. I wish you a blessed and healthy and safe New Year and uh, an upcoming year that's profitable and uh, you know works out for you and your and your family. Uh, we'll talk to you next week, guys. Thanks uh, for the support and thanks for a, a great 2023.